Right, good afternoon everyone, and welcome to this session, which for some reason is called live. I could have sworn we had lots of live people in previous sessions. But I think what it really means is that basically we've got a theme and we're going to make it up as we go along in very creative and interesting ways. And I'm looking forward to what it's going to be like, actually. I think to start with, though, I'd just like to say we decided that as we've looked back on this incredible conference, in various ways, we've all been talking about the need to challenge assumptions, the power of challenging assumptions. And as I look back on my career, when we first started out to bring business leaders to the table, it was clear that we had a world where we had business people on one side, people with disabilities on another, and government and NGOs and disabled people's organizations in the middle. And as I looked at it, you realize that actually everybody had pretty goofy ideas about everybody else. So people with disabilities had assumptions about what the charities were going to do in government, and some of those were goofier than others. And certainly business had some very strange ideas about people with disabilities and the agencies in the middle. And the agencies in the middle had some very strange ideas about business and disabled people. And so actually, we took a conscious effort, a conscious decision to bring people from the business community and people from the disability community together, face to face, for the personal conversations that would challenge all those assumptions that were getting in the way. And so you hear, you hear these assumptions in the little remarks. I, I uh, spoke once at the Global Summit of Women, uh, which we all know meant women, women, not disabled women. And a woman came up to me afterwards and said, I really enjoyed your speech. You know, I spent the entire day with disabled people in Canada recently, and I was the only whole person in the room. And so I wandered around talking about partial people for days. But the idea that she was the only whole person, what does that tell us about deep-rooted assumptions running through? And she was one of the good guys. She wanted to get disability on the list. I had someone once say, well, of course, as a hotel, you know, um, we, we care about disabled customers, and we've got a special weekend set aside, and we're going to do everything very slowly. It's one of my favorites. Um, I had a, a chief information officer, a very senior person, tell me in all seriousness, well, blind people can't use the internet, so why should I have an accessible online recruitment system? Where does that come from? Now, is that, is that bias, or is that just dumb? Or, you know. But the assumptions that underpin the obstacles that we encounter when we're trying to enable people with disabilities to get the life chances they deserve are very, very powerful indeed. And one of my additional favorites was how many times have I had a manager say, I hired a disabled person once, Susan, didn't work. So my answer now, I hired a man once, didn't work. But I highlight it just to say it's those assumptions. And so what I've asked my colleagues to do, this is a new team, never worked together before. They're in direct competition, I think, not sure. Israel, on my right, have decided that they want to talk about the individual reaction, what it really means for human beings, the power of these assumptions. And so I look forward to what you've cobbled together in Israel overnight. Overnight, mm -hmm. literally. Thank you. Okay, first of all, thank you very much. And again, uh, I've said it all throughout these past uh, two day, three days. This is the third one. I am very, very uh, honored and happy um, and uh, feel very lucky to be here at the Zero Project uh, Conference, which I am a true believer of. Um, and I want to start with a sh really short story. Um, one of my top uh, employees at Access Israel, um, I think she's one of the smartest, most uh, creative, intelligent, um, professional people I know. She's very verbal, she's very, uh, she knows how to present, uh, and she's the advisor, leading advisor for the biggest, largest companies in Israel on accessibility. And in one of her uh, meetings, she had a conference where she uh, gave a lecture to a municipality. And as usual, she was amazing. And at the end of the lecture, the person in charge of the education department in that municipality came to her and said something like, wow, for a disabled woman, you're so verbal. 
And I must tell you that we encounter a lot of reactions throughout our uh, job at Access Israel, but it's the first time that I saw her truly hurt. And she said, I forgot to mention, she's uh, uh, in a wheelchair. Um, you can see it's one of those uh, disabilities that are visible. And she said, all throughout my life, people uh, looked at me and I saw uh, the way they react. And for that, I'm fine. But the minute they challenged me and couldn't uh, accept me and couldn't believe that I can actually talk, that was, for me, uh, something very painful to, to hear, that they made the assumption, didn't see me. So that's what we wanted to check, and if the tech people can... Uh, oh, I have uh, right there. this one. Okay. So bear with me again overnight. Explain the process you mean. Yeah, and because there are... Uh, I'll just make it a little accessible. What we did is we, in the last 24 hours, we just walked around and asked people here two questions. The first one was, what assumptions do you think people assume about you when you walk in a room? And the second one is what do they want, what do you want them to think about you? Um, it was supposed to be a video, but presentation is just fine. Uh, and I'll read it out loud for whoever uh, is having problems uh, reading it. So our first candidate, a um, uh, big, enormous smile in a wheelchair, uh, he says that when he walks in a room, they say, oh my God, what happened to him? Oh, he's a poor guy. And what he actually wants to be said is, I'm a filmmaker, a YouTube creator, a social activist. Our next one, um, she says that when she walks into a room, everybody looks at her and assumes she's a Catholic nun and uh, that's it. And she wants them to know that beyond that she has a full life and does a lot like promoting blind people. This guy, who looks very serious and uses a cane to walk around, says that he looks at people when they look at him and they say, he sees in their eyes, they say pity, probably he's very frustrated, in constant struggle. In this picture, by the way, he does look in, <laughs> a little intimidating. Well, he's but cross. It's always just cross. Yes, yes. But what he wants them to know, that he can reach the stars. He can manage large-scale projects and he's happily married and most importantly, a proud dad. Another guy with a cane from Turkey, our Turkish uh, representative, he says that uh, people see him and immediately they wish him good health, assume that he's sick, he had an accident, they think it's temporary. He says he wants them to look at me, not at my disability, just come up and say hi. And Neta also, uh, using a, um, a scooter to uh, um, move around. She says when she comes in, she feels pity. People again saying, pity, what can she do? She probably needs help. How can I help her? And actually, she wants to say that she's one of the leading professionals in Israel on accessibility, and she's the one who's helping others. Another participant here, I think she's from Norway, maybe she's here in the audience, says that when she comes in, people look at her like a social worker, she, they think bureaucrat, middle-aged woman. Oops. <laughs> and that's what she looks like? No, it just jumped, how do we take it back? Um, what she wanted to say, basically, is that she's actually able to think out of the box. She likes, she doesn't think like a bureaucrat, and they want her to see that in, that, in her. Another guy who is deaf, uh, by the way, an amazing uh, story because he put, um, what do you call the, the? Implant? Implant. He put an implant and he decided that his identity is of a deaf person. And after several years, he took it out and he returned to be a, um, a deaf person, and he said that whenever he comes into a room, he can't talk, they, people think he can't talk, he's weird, he's probably tough to work with, they assume I can't understand what people say about me, when actually, and I'm having technical problems here, he wants to say, I'm just like anyone else, you don't need to hear to have a really big heart, and I can help others. Then we have 
a lady, very big smile again, um, visually impaired. And she says when she walks in a room, people say, oh, well, though she's good looking, she's still a poor thing because of her problem with the eyes. And she wants them to say, don't think about my blindness, but think about how full is my life. I have a child, family, I'm happy. And here we have uh, a short, can you put on the short uh, um, video, short clip? So there are two questions. Two questions. The first is, what do people assume about you um, when they learn, know what, that you're autistic? Um, I have no idea what people assume about me. I'm always surprised that people give people give any thought to me at all. Um, so that's a bit confusing. Back to that. It's not artistic. It's autistic. Um, back to the presentation, and basically in a gist, what he said was, I'm always surprised, people even thought, and I missed it here, I'm always surprised people even give a thought to me at all. And when we, we asked him, what would you like people to think about me? They said, he said, don't seem to be any of my business how others see me. Our next friend, again with autism, can you put the clip over there? Once I told someone I had PTSD and there was no reaction. Then when I told them I was autistic, they put their hand on my shoulder and said, there, there, never mind. and what he would like them to, do, to, to know about him. He wants to see people to see him as part of society, not a part. This is just really a gist, but the idea is very clear. People look at other people and they see stigmas. They decide for themselves what that person is all about. And when you're a person with disability, it's even more so. Um, I can tell you that in Access Israel, uh, that is our focus, uh, breaking the stigmas, uh, and we do it with kids who are five, six, seven years old, and we do it with the biggest uh, CEOs in Israel and governmental officials, and the idea is that we don't come and talk about, we don't uh, lecture about, we make sure the people that we train and the people we educate uh, meet the people themselves. It's people to people. They meet the people with the disabilities and as one bus driver once told me, in the past every blind person that came on the bus, I just saw the disability. He's blind. Now everyone comes and I think about Lydia, the counselor, the blind counselor, the counselor that gave him a peek to what really life is for a person who is blind and he sees the person behind the disability. So. That's the idea. Thank you. Now, I was conscious as I listened to watched that, that many of you in the room would regard this as self-evidently true. Hands up. You, I mean, you know this. What I think I'm hoping we can come up with today is new ways of communicating this insight. Because actually, I found some of those comments, and I've been around this a while, some of those comments you want to then quote and be able to use. And so I'm going to ask Israel if you would produce this in a format which people can then use and use it to get your own people talking to, your own stakeholders and so on. For me, the, um, the switch of it is the business leaders who actually feel on occasion quite insulted that they are blamed for the fact that people with disabilities don't get job. I had a, a senior manager go to a conference on disability and she came back to me and said, I was blamed for every bad thing that every bank has ever done. And so the assumption that because you work in a bank, you must be wearing a black hat. Remember this image of the cowboys and the white hats and the black hats? And so she was actually a white hat. She was trying to learn more so she could persuade her company to engage. But she was seen in the context of bank, black hat, must be the problem, hostility. And I can tell you, she never, ever again went to a conference on disability. So these assumptions are just so interesting. 
But while I watched that, I also thought, have you, do you remember the old campaign in America where they had a poster that showed uh, an elderly gentleman from the back, and it said, um, you know, what was it? And it showed him in a wheelchair and from the back, so you couldn't see the wheelchair. And it said, some people call him disabled, right, when the wheelchair was showing, and then it showed him just from the waist up, and other people call you Mr. President, because it was Franklin D. Roosevelt. Mm. So from the back, he's the wheelchair user, face to face, gosh, he's Mr. President. You know, this kind of communication, I think, we've kind of lost in the system at the moment, and we need to be much, much more effective at it. We're now going to turn to two of our colleagues from an, an outfit that is supposed to be artistic by definition, Mainspring Arts. You've got arts in your job title. Yes. And so it's Katya and Miranda. And you've taken a view of the kind of assumptions that surround autism and the power they have. Hello. Um, so Mainspring Arts is an organization that ca uh, creates opportunities in the arts for neurodivergent people. And neurodivergency is a new term that includes conditions such as autism spectrum condition, mental health conditions, and other neurological conditions that signify a way of thinking and processing that um, is, differs from the neurotypical. Um, the opportunities that we provide can be a pathway into employment in the arts, or they can simply be a way of developing the skills and talents of our participants in an environment that meets their needs, it's inclusive and accessible. We're currently in the middle of our flagship project, which is called Square Peg Stories. Square Peg Stories is a creative writing opportunity for adults on the autism spectrum. We've run a series of creative writing workshops, each one led by a different published author. Um, over the course of the project, each of our participants has been working on a short story and at, uh, they've had mentoring from published authors throughout and at the end of the project, their stories will be published in an anthology with a foreword by the novelist David Mitchell. Um, one of our aims with Square Peg Stories was to challenge the assumptions many people make about people on the autism spectrum. For example, some people might assume that they're not intellectually capable or that they have learning difficulties, which can be frustrating. Um, a lot of people assume that being autistic is a pity or that it's some kind of deficit, whereas in reality, our participants see it as an integral part of their identity and that actually it is responsible for many of their greatest assets and skills. Um, this isn't to say that they don't encounter difficulties, but many of these are made up of the fact that people make assumptions about them and that there aren't reasonable adjustments made in their environments. Some people might assume that some well-known representations of autism, for example, the book, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, and the film Rain Man, are representative of all autistic people, when in fact we know that all autistic people are individuals and no single representation could fit them all. Um, people assume that they're not creative or imaginative and that they don't understand metaphor or discrete meaning and therefore they can't participate in artistic projects, they can't create art, they can't understand artistic meaning. Um, they assume that they're only interested in science and technology and pursuing careers in those fields or sort of routine-based work. We know that this is not true. Our participants are all amazingly creative, amazingly talented and capable. They all have unique persp perspectives and distinctive voices. And we would like to demonstrate this by showing you a video of some of our participants reading their work. Hello, mother, it's me, Flois. It is not the cliffs and canyons of concrete, steel and glass. It is not the litter blown in the breeze. The garden was empty, untouched for four years, but not unloved. 
The pale woman said, I am Penny Gabriel. I've heard your wish and I've made it come true. Clip clop, clip clop, the sound of horse hooves tapping against the cobble street. He must have known a life is what he's made of it and from it, like all of us, there was stillness and a trembling loss of patience manifesting itself in the hallway. It is not the silent, wind-haunted cranes. The plants left unkempt had grown wild. Trevor Mackey? she asked. Uh, uh, yes, replied Trevor nervously. I turned from where I'd been scrubbing at a rusty old pocket watch, frowning at the black, posh carriage bouncing down the street. He will have known, as we will do, the broken can be mended or still useful. You never told me while we were engaged about Floyce. It is not the arms lifting, embracing. Trevor couldn't stop shaking as he stood on the spot all soaking wet. The conflagration so blinding bright he was aware of nothing but that fire's white light. He filled and hung the new green bird feeder on the frayed line. The carriage comes past me, giving me a brief glimpse of the people inside. None of these make this city. Trevor faced forward to see a puff of white smoke. Straining to notice any atmospheric disturbance. They may not have noticed anything out of the ordinary. The world would not stop burning, ever. Hearts are longer than arms. It took three weeks till the first sparrows returned. As she rounded the corner up the last steps, they hugged each other and found themselves floating up in the air. Oh, Tony, hearts are wider than eyes. You do make a wonderful looking foal. But I'm just never going to feel comfortable dressed as a horse. We need more representations of neurodivergent people in the arts. And when I say the arts, I mean literature, film, theatre, TV, music, and visual art. Art is powerful. Most of us consume it in some form on a daily basis. It influences us and shapes our thinking. It has a huge impact. And so it's vital that we see and hear neurodivergent people in the arts, and not just stories about neurodivergent people. The voices of neurodivergent and disabled people are often represented by neurotypical and non-disabled people, and this needs to change. We need more stories by neurodivergent people in order to tackle these stereotypes and change these perceptions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hearts are longer than arms. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. I'm not sure why, but I do. So, the power of assumptions. I think one assumption we should be challenging is the, is the assumption that the speed of change is acceptable. And I, what I'm seeing as we look at the power of the arts and challenging and so on, is that perhaps the assumption that we slowly evolve so that disabled people get a better deal in what, 20 years, 50 years, 100? It's just not good enough anymore, is it? And one assumption that really needs to be challenged, I think, is that the regulatory frameworks, the, the way the laws are operating, you know, the way we define what is and is not acceptable behavior in the countries in which we live is acceptable. And I note that the assumption that quotas are useful, maybe, starting to be questioned a bit more. Uh, the 19, uh, 2018 constitutes the 100th anniversary of the creation of quotas with all the assumptions about the unemployability of people, assumptions about business, assumptions about how the state can generate income from a policy which by de definition only generates income when it fails. And so I don't want to really lower the, the tone here. I just wanted to say that I think the assumption about the speed of change really has to be tackled and that we need a little edgier, we need to be edgier in, in our way of presenting the need for change, that we're talking about the lives of human beings, not a theoretical construct in a human rights document. And so I wanted to close this session, but though we'll be open to conversations and, and so on afterwards, with some examples of the kind of edgy communications that we're starting to see, edgy in different ways. And so the first one is uh, one some of you may have seen before, but I'm showing it because it's in many countries, it, it breaks this assumption that you actually can't giggle about the subject of disability. And my theory is, if you can't giggle with people, working with them is really hard. And so, could I have the Barclays video, please?
The Barclays video is completely wasted without sound. You said using cash machines is difficult when you're visually impaired. Hello, my name is Chris McCausland. I'm a stand-up comedian and I'm also blind. And I'm here to tell you about these. Barclays new talking cash machines. In the past, I haven't always had that much luck with machines that can talk, if I'm honest with you. A lot of the things I own at home talk, and I've got a talking microwave when you beep, 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 three minutes, beep, defrost bread. That's quite handy, isn't it? It's got one of them big kajunky buttons at the bottom that you kajunk and it fires the door open at you. And as you kajunk and fire the door open at you, it says, door open. <laughs> and do you think I don't realise I just did that? You close it with your own hand, it says door closed. I've got a patronising microwave. It might as well just say, you're in the kitchen, Chris. Do you need help? So if you can't see, using a cash machine hasn't always been the easiest thing to do. Okay, so there was a bump on the number five, but apart from that, you just had to press all the buttons at random and see what happens. I think there's a small chance it might have been me that started the recession doing that. Or you had to remember exactly what button to press and in what order. Come on, having to remember things. That's so 2005. I was in Glasgow. I came across a Pelican Crossing that spoke instead of beeping. Because we know where we are with the beeps, don't we? Beep, 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 you cross the road. It's just encoded into your brain. It's second nature, you know. But rather than beep, this one spoke. But it wouldn't go as far as to tell you that the cars had actually stopped, maybe for some kind of legal reasons, it wasn't allowed to be that definite about the, 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 what was unfolding in front of you. So what we would do is it would announce that the cars from the left have been advised to stop. <laughs> Basically, uh, I've done all I can, but I can't promise you anything. You've got to take your own chances in this world. So if you want to use one of these machines, you've got to bring your own earphones, which means that the first task will almost certainly be untangling your earphones. Strange, isn't it? We live in a world where we can transplant a human face and we've still got tangly headphones. You can spot talking cash machines, because they're the ones with the, the, the headphone socket on the, on the thing, because you've got to... You've got to put headphones into the machine for it to talk. Obviously, it doesn't just blur out. Enter pin four, two, eight, seven. Giving you 300 pounds in cash now. Just a shifty bloke behind you with a hammer and a biro. Writing your pin number on his hammer. Forgotten his pad, hasn't he? With a new talking cash machine, it's so much easier. Of course, you mightn't always want to hear what it's got to say to you. The last thing I need reading out loud to me at the start of a night out is my bank balance. The last, last thing I need reminding of is my failure in life to even have as much as zero. Just lie to me. now introduced over 3,000 audio cash machines across the UK. To find the one nearest you, go to barclays.co.uk slash branch locator. Well, what did we think? Yeah? We always brought disabled comedians in to dinner with senior executives uh, for about three or four years in the UK. And to to actually have a chance to, to laugh together. Very powerful. But this has also worked very well for Barclays. And of course, it's inspired other companies in the banking sector to kind of go, why is Barclays getting all this credit for being disability confident? Maybe we should start to up our game. Next, we're going to show you an advertisement that resulted from a competition that Channel 4 in the UK launched, where they announced that the best advertisements which featured people with disabilities would get a million pounds free airtime with the channel. And they had a great response, hundreds of companies interested as advertisers in persuading their corporate clients to actually take this up. The winner was Mars, and it's inspired them to now seriously look at how they portray and involve people with disabilities because they can see the results. They've actually 
generated sales with, with, with this kind of communication. So could we have the Mars ad, please? And they're going to do it again next year, by the way. So how was the big wedding? Oh, yeah. you heard. Yeah. So it's at the end of the night, everyone's on the dance floor really getting into oh, it, you yeah. know? Yeah, and say, this is my left wheel, oh. and this is the bride's foot. Yeah. Bush. How awful. Well, it wasn't all bad. I left with the best man's number. You no. are terrible. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not inviting you to my wedding. No. That's it, you're off the list. Now, there were a whole series of ads around the Malteser theme, but the point is that they have worked brilliantly for Mars, and I, I hope you agree this, this fresh approach to portrayal and representation and inclusion and so on is where we're all trying to go. And I think I'm going to end with a showreel from Channel 4. Now, Channel 4, as many, how many of you have seen the work they did on the Paralympics? Yeah, hands up, please. So you're familiar with that really edgy and challenging communication that they did on both the 2012 and the Rio Olympics. And so it, it comes about because the company has spent at least 15 years talking to with people with disabilities and involving them in thinking about how it enhances their creativity, their connectivity to their audiences, and places them as a public broadcaster in a thought leadership mode that's actually shifting society in the direction that I know we would all want society to move. So uh, as you watch what Channel 4 has done and how this is simply a show wheel showing the ways in which people with disabilities are now appearing in all kinds of programming, whether it's reality television, drama, whatever. Programs about people with disabilities often simply as a character and part of the, the, the play, if you like. How many of the broadcasters in the countries in which you operate are part of driving the speed of change that we need? And I'd like to suggest, perhaps, uh, because everybody loves telling Project uh, Zero Project what to do, <laughs> we just why don't we add a broadcaster section to the next one? Let's take a look at where the portrayal of people with disabilities in broadcasting can be brought to bear to speed up the, the change that we're after. And so I'm going to leave you with this. And we, we don't know if uh, you're going to want any questions or not. I know the panel is more than happy to have a discussion after this. But for me, in terms of the live program, this is where I wanted us to finish. This is what we, we, we need in every country in which we operate. Go. promised an amazing show that inspires us to think of what makes us human. What a performance. Another star is born here in Rio. If you haven't told someone you've got a disability, you've got to try and get it in there somewhere. I was born with like, arthrogryphosis. For me, it's always about just how you get on with somebody. For a disabled child like Daisy, being five is a particularly difficult age. I am so proud of myself. <laughs> you hurt a lot of people back home. You don't know what you're talking about. Do you not know what he did back then? Did he never tell you he's a cold-blooded killer? How does your autism affect you? I think it works as both an advantage and a disadvantage. It gives me great memory. If things are too crowded, I will just swim off. Yeah, so you got going to switch the implant on now. I can hear what you're saying. I can hear me. 
Hola! Mark and Ian are my new friends. Look at me. I am vulnerable. Yeah? Hola, he's in a wheelchair. Not the f***ing wheelchair. My clothes. Both Andrea's father and sister Joanne are disabled. Accessibility and space are key for family visits. And I lost my arm uh, at the forearm, so I'm on the left, below elbow on the tee. They're following us. Time's up. Come on. Suggest you Time's up. up. I have mild epilepsy. I can't apply for the army. So doing this course will be the closest to experiencing the real SES selection. Joined once again by Baroness uh, Tani Gray Thompson. Tani, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, just, you. Just pass me my leg, please. I don't want it to define me. I'm not the Hannah with one leg. I'm Hannah. Go on. Do you black out often? Um, it used to happen at least four or five times a day. I once forgot, like, two weeks. My arthritis is so much better when I come here. How quickly do you, do you notice that change then? It's almost immediate, actually. So I'm jumping or doing yeah. a show, a bit of sweat, whoa, it's out the window. <laughs> I think a lot of people don't realise that when you've had a bad back, just how much it does affect your life. I put a lot on now and, and it's starting to make me feel quite guilty. Not someone I um, have control of. I would give you one more chance. Sniff my dick. I'm pretty that. Cock. You can say you sign your name. No, don't swear. <laughs> Stop. The part of my body I like most is actually my amputated leg because every day it reminds me that obstacles are just really opportunities in disguise. to disability. It makes me proud to be disabled. So come closer. So come closer. <clears throat> what do you think? Any comments? Time for a glass of wine? <laughs> In the back. Question? Yes? Oh, oh please. Hi, oh, yes. Oh, wow, that's really loud. Okay. Um, my name's Kathy Guernsey, and I live in the United States, but I grew up in Britain, so I'm very familiar with Channel 4 and what they did around the Paralympics. And one of the things that I really appreciated was that they were willing to take a chance and go into this area of programming what we have found, frankly, in the United States is that a lot of the broadcasters want you to make a business case and show numbers of viewers, and they justify not having sufficient programming because when they do have programming, they put it on very late at night at a time when you won't get many viewers. And as a consequence, it reinforces their assumption that there's no business case for engaging in this kind of programming. And Channel 4 did it the other way around. They were willing to believe that this is something that they should do. They did it right. And in doing it right, they built it and people will come, right? So what can we do to help? We can showcase Channel 4. We can showcase what they've done. But that hasn't been enough so far to bring those other broadcasters on board. So what suggestions do people have? Thank you. Thank you. Can I just make an observation, which is that Channel 4 has made a point of ensuring that when they have a soap opera, one of the characters happens to be in a wheelchair, happens to have epilepsy. That what they've done is to infiltrate real live situations, real live people, real live actors, etc not just put programs about disability up on, on screen. And so the question of how they moved from having to, to have a business case for even addressing disability on screen to actually simply saying it's about creativity, so it's a very interesting question. How do we communicate that? Any suggestions from the audience? Anyone here who is, who is engaged with the broadcasters in your, in your countries with any experience? I can say, as I look at the Channel 4 experience, we had a broadcaster's disability network for 15 years that brought every major broadcaster together with people with disabilities who were working or wanting to work in the industry. 
and, and just thrashed out. What is it? Why if we're reflecting the communities in which we operate? Where's the creative challenge? We're supposed to be so creative. So why are we ignoring all this reality out there, all this potential for drama and, and so on? And, and it, it didn't happen overnight. But it was that, that connectivity between people with disabilities and, and the broadcasters that made it all shift. OK, well, perhaps we leave it as, as a challenge. I would like to You'd add like to, yes, uh, one, uh, one comment. We're talking a lot uh, at Zero Project about how to educate and change you know, the rest of society. Um, but I must say, at least I had an incident. Uh, um, I was sitting in one conference with uh, people uh, beside me, one in a wheelchair, one was blind, was, one has, had an amputation in the hand. Um, you know, each one of the people besides me, you know, my grandmother would probably say, oh, good health, I hope everything will be uh, okay with, the, and I hope it won't happen to you. And while we were sitting there, another person walked in with another disability. And the funny thing is, exactly the thing that each and every one sitting at my table fights again and calls again, happened when the other disability walked in. And their reaction was, ay, ay, ay. Poor thing, he's probably so difficult and, you know, the same assumptions they're assuming about them, they reflected on others. So I think a, a, a good point to take with us is we're an amazing bunch of people and we should applaud ourselves for each and everything we're doing in our countries, but we have to remember also to look at ourselves and make sure that by example, we make the difference really stick. If I see a hand go up, we'll keep going another couple of minutes. If not, perhaps we'll draw this session to a close. We have a hand. We have a hand. Okay. It feels what is the kind of program like an auction where you give them one, <laughs> one more chance. Hello. Yes, my name is Shirley Kenny from Israel. Uh, my question for Susan, uh, do you have a work with government spoke, spokesmen because what we saw that they want to sell the Cinderella story as I have disabled people and how the services giving them hope instead of the story of abled people that the services are keeping developing and support them instead. Do we have any government ministers in the room? I think it's extremely difficult to influence what a government minister says in any country. Uh, the, time, the, the trick, if you like, is to try to get them to see that by um, that using messages which stress that their objective is to enable talented people to contribute to the societies in which they operate makes it easier to persuade employers to offer them opportunities. That the messages about these people are dependent on the state uh, the very negative messages that some ministers give out, simply makes it harder for them to get a job and to come off state benefits. But in our, exper in our experience, the best we can do is to empower uh, articulate people with disabilities, the movement, so that they can challenge the officials, get the fresh messages through, and to volunteer, if you like, to help them to communicate in a new and better way. It's not much of an answer, is it, really? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope okay. you found that of interest. Thank you for coming. Yeah. And before thank we finish, panel. I will give you a thank short you, summary you. with my drawings. Oh, and I've, I've been a terrible, terrible chairperson. I was supposed to say, and here we have Petra, <laughs> who is going to take us through how she's tried to capture everything that we've covered on a large piece of paper. Exactly. I look forward to seeing what you um, do. We'll just find a place for me so I don't stand in front of you and in front of the uh, interpreters. And so that still everybody can see the drawings up on the wall. I'll just switch sides, just a second. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, how great is it that there are still so many people in this room? It's been a long time, a lot of difficult and interesting topics, and we're all here. And we're all here for this live show um, that was all about the power of challenging assumptions. Assumptions in the heads of people. Um, and challenging them with a sword <laughs> um, on both sides.
on the sides of people with disabilities, but also on the abled body persons. So um, it was called a live show. So we have live people here on stage with their summaries and with their videos and presentations we heard. The first one being uh, from Access Israel and I have to look at you first. Um, what you did, you went around the conference, right? And made interviews. So these interviews were taken and we saw them in a uh, form of a PowerPoint presentation. And within these interviews, you asked two questions. What assumptions do people have about you? And what do you want people to think about you? And I just grasped some of the answers, didn't get all of them, but for instance, one person said, well, I want them to say, hey, I'm a filmmaker. Or, look at my abilities instead of my disabilities. Or, look at me, I can reach the stars. Or another one saying, hey, think outside of the box, and I am outside of the box. Look at me. Um, and also saying that I'm just like everybody else. I'm part of society. I'm not special, I'm just part of all of us. And another person also said, it don't seem to be my problem what think people think about me. That's a good one, isn't it? So to sum it up, um, it was all about seeing beyond the disability and seeing the person instead and making sure that we are all part of society and a diverse and inclusive world. The second project, was an artistic project um, from Great Britain. It's called Mainspring Arts. And um, what it tries to do and what it actually successfully seems to do is using art as a pathway to inclusion, as a way to come into society, to learn skills, to be an artist and to be a valuable member of society. You're using different kinds of art. The project we were presented was about people with the um, autistic spectrum who are all individuals. And we have these stereotypes in mind from movies we pr probably have seen, and that's not the, the message. The message is people uh, with the autistic uh, spectrum are individuals and they have writing skills, for instance. And we heard, um, remember, we heard them reading out their arts. And it was difficult for me to capture, and in my head it was like a bunch of flowers growing out of this literature, out of these words. So that's how I tried to sketch it, with flowers, different kinds of flowers. Um, I think the main message uh, was we need more um, neurodivergent people in arts, because that will make arts more colorful and more lively. And last but not least, not to forget, I think, if I got it right, um, you see it as a message towards the media, that media actually is an important um, medium to make sure that attitudes get changed, from negative to positive. And he said, we have to speak out loud that faster change must come. And we see it, for instance, we saw three different examples of videos, and the last one for Channel 4, and I just captured one message here on the bottom. Um, make disability the new normal. And that should be my last sentence today. Thank you very much. Thank you.